What's going on smart people? Today I want to talk about cheating in physics. You know, you talk to any physics professor, they're going to tell you cheating's bad, okay? You don't don't cheat's bad. But I want to share my perspective on cheating as another physics student. Something that they don't advertise to physics students is how insanely easy it can be to cheat at times. I mean, think about it. Your first year of physics, you're probably doing mastering physics. You're taking a course on physics that's been well established for a couple hundred years. Every problem that's been asked has been asked a million different times by a million different people in a million different ways. There's going to be solutions online. And the same thing goes for even upper level courses like e &M. If you're using the Griffiths book, all the solutions are online. Some of them are wrong, but they're still online. The point that I'm trying to make is that if you want to cheat in physics, there is absolutely nothing stopping you. And instead of trying to convince you not to cheat, I'd just sort of like to share why I don't. And this isn't high and mighty Andrew saying, I've never cheated before. In university physics, there were mastering physics assignments where I used the Yahoo answers. Of course that has happened. But the point is that I didn't let that become me. I, I found out, I realized why that's not what I wanted to do. Part of the reason for me not becoming that person who cheats was I would have conversations with actual physics professors. I would like to understand what they understand. I wanted to get their opinions on things. And there was one professor who thought I was a good student. We would chat from time to time and he would tell me his opinion on cheating. And I remember him bringing up how, you know, it's going to happen. People are going to get away with it. But then he mentioned how but then they have absolutely nothing to be proud of. It's like you can go through your entire physics career, you can you know, do marginally okay on your exams, they might get curved at the end and do really well on the homework because you've cheated on them and end up getting your degree. But then it's like, man, you've, you don't deserve it and you should know that. And for me, that's all it really took. I just I recognized that that's a slippery slope to go down. I didn't want to spend all that time in school just to feel like I didn't actually earn it. Now that extreme case worked for me to not want to be a cheater, but even so, even if you're someone who doesn't do it consistently, I still don't think cheating is worth it. But instead of being that person that says don't do it and then doesn't offer any alternatives, I'd kind of like to talk about the alternatives a little bit because maybe it's something you hadn't thought of. So if you're someone who is set on actually solving the problems. You want to be able to have something to be proud of and be like, hell yeah, I figured that out. There becomes this whole, where the hell is all this time going to come from that it takes to actually solve these problems? Sometimes there are just problem sets that it might be too difficult or too long or a combination of both and you physically cannot finish them in time. What do you do? Well, if you're anticipating it, you could always try to ask for an extension, but something that I've actually done before is I've gone to my professor, I've said I wasn't able to complete the homework in time, I didn't want to cheat, so here's my incomplete homework. If I can get an extended, that's awesome. If not, can I meet you during your office hours to talk about this question that I wasn't able to solve? You tell any physics professor that, they're going to know that you're not too great with time management, but they're going to know that you're honest and that you're determined to still not have those weak points. They're going to be more on your team than ever. You gotta understand, you are the future of physics. They're, these professors are invested in your success. So it's like resulting to something like cheating is unnecessary because they're already willing to do so much for you. Hell, you come to a professor with that, later on they might be more willing to round up that 89 to a 90 than otherwise. And then you could say, well, if you're cheating and you're saying that that means that you don't really earn the grade that you get, then if someone rounds it up, does that mean that you really earned that grade? Well, that's more for the professor to decide. They're only going to round it up if you do deserve it. So taking the L on the couple homework points because you didn't get that solved, but gaining some of that investment from your professor, I think is an awesome compromise. Uh, and that's just if you really can't solve the problem in time. Now, something that is not cheating and is actually typically encouraged by professors that can help you so that you don't reach that point to where you physically don't have any time to solve the problem is working with other people. I hope it goes without saying that I'm not saying, yeah, what'd you get for number three? That's, that's not it at all. But you know, you're working in a study group and you're about to tackle a problem and you say to yourself, all right, finding an electric field, I'm going to use Coulomb's law, it'll be easy peasy. Then your buddy goes, yeah, but that's, that's a sphere. Isn't that like spherical symmetry? Shouldn't we use Gauss's law? Being able to shine those assumptions with a light, those false assumptions of where you could start can help you get through that problem much faster. And I don't think that you're losing anything in doing that. But when it comes to study groups like that, I typically, actually, I never like to work with more than one other person. And this is because people arrive at conclusions at different times. And the more people you have, have, the more exaggerated this difference is. So you might have people that reach certain conclusions, everyone agrees on it but you, you're not too sure but you don't want to hold up the group so you move on and that's where you can start to benefit less from solving each problem with people in a group. So 
two people in the group, I think that works best for me. I think it also helps if the person you're studying with is roughly at the same level as you. If time is the thing that you're worried about, then you don't want someone who knows a lot less than you to where you have to constantly be explaining things. But it also sucks to feel like everyone knows more than you and, and feel like you're not contributing to the group. But in summary, guys, I don't cheat and I'm glad I don't cheat because when I walked across stage at graduation in May, I had the sense of pride because I knew that I did it and I made it happen and no one could take that from me. And there are so many resources that can make your life a bit easier without resulting to cheating, like utilizing your professor's office hours and having a more just open communication policy with your professor. It's just, it's so helpful. And also forming things like study groups so that people can help fill in the gaps that you may or may not know that you have. But this is a short video. There's tons of other blatantly obvious reasons why cheating is not a chill thing to do that I didn't feel the need to emphasize in video. Like, for example, if you cheat, then you don't actually learn the material. If you want to go to grad school, then you're going there with, you know, a handicap that you didn't actually learn. But that's stuff that I think is, is super obvious. But if there is something that might not have been very obvious that you think I should have said, comment it in the comment section below so that other people can see it. So be sure to do that. I'll see you guys there. Thanks for watching.